The waters are still, the shipyard almost silent. But a century ago, this grey Belfast quayside witnessed a legend in the making. This was the birthplace of the most famous ship the world has ever seen, Titanic. She was to be colossal, magnificent, built to match the vision of the men who made her. Men driven by boundless ambition. Yes, I am laying down a challenge. Perhaps the greatest in the history of shipbuilding. By a sense of foreboding. Surely the first rule of safety must be to think the unthinkable. And by absolute conviction. Is the ship safer? We don't know of it. As far as I'm concerned, she is practically unsinkable. But the true forgotten Titanic story is that of the workers who built the world's most luxurious ship with their bare hands. It's a story of violence and high political drama, of despair and tragedy, and of shame. Titanic, five years in the making, sank in less than three hours. 1,500 died. Among them, a handful of the shipyard men who brought her to life. This is the untold story of those men and their ship. This is Titanic. She was born in the great Edwardian era of luxury liners. Shipyards around the world were locked in a ferocious battle. Who could build the biggest ships, the most lavish, the fastest? The pride of nations was at stake, and the pride of workers too. Every new ship carried an elite troubleshooting team to handle any problems. Titanic was no different. Her troubleshooters were called the Guarantee Group. Just eight ship workers from 14,000 who would sail on her maiden voyage. Their story began five years earlier. This was the London home of the shipbuilder William Piddy. That night, he was entertaining another shipping magnate. Their every attempt at competition is no more than an act of vanity. Piddy was a hard-nosed Ulsterman. Ignore the fact that it's their ship that has broken the record for crossing the Atlantic. Bruce Ismay, a fastidious Englishman. As owner of the White Star shipping line, Ismay faced a challenge. His rivals, Cunard, were building new, fast liners. And as I've always said, Bruce, speed isn't everything. But surely you understand why White Star must respond. You really want to get caught up in some ridiculous competition with Cunard? I hadn't realized you were so concerned with prestige, Bruce. Without prestige, the White Star Line, and for that matter, your shipyard too, William, has no future. Cunard's pursuit of speed is futile. The costs just don't add up. And if people want scale, we'll give them scale. You see her as big as the Mauritania? No, half as big again. The biggest ship the world has ever seen. You think it's achievable? I have the best marine engineers in the world. You know that. What about the accommodation? The most luxurious imaginable. And the price? Our usual terms. Cost plus 4%. That would still be astronomical. And to compete with Cunard, we'd need two ships. To trump them. You'd need three. The deal was made in Belgravia, but it was Belfast where Titanic would be built. Belfast was Ireland's industrial heart, and its lifeblood was the talent of its workers. They'd made Piddy's company, Harland and Wolf, the biggest shipbuilder in the world. Now a handful of them were about to enter legend. 
Alfie Cunningham, just 16, was starting as an apprentice. Nervous, Alfie? Who's nervous? His widowed mother had six mouths to feed. Alfie was man of the house. Artie Frost, 33 years old, was moving up in the yard. That hat, Artie. Oh, Foreman fitter, a change of status. Morning. Tommy Miller, age 25, was a ship's carpenter. I'll see you boys, all right. Tell me your piece. Oh. You'd forget your head if it wasn't screwed on. Bye. The yard was a hard place. The six-day week brought as little as a pound to take home. Late arrivals were locked out. Discipline was the foreman's job. Everyone a god in a bowler hat. A word from the foreman could mean either a job for life or no job at all. Mr. Frost! Mr. Frost! I know my name, Sean. Are you me? Alfred Cunningham, sir. Starting today, eh? Yes, sir. Apprentice better. There were 14,000 workers in the yard, and Alfie Cunningham was bottom of the heap. Tell me what you know about a ship's engine, young man. Nothing, sir. Then you better waste no time in learning, son, or you'll be out in your ear. Artie Frost had started as an apprentice. He knew how the yard worked. His ability had brought steady progress. But to get the foreman's job, He'd had to wait until his father retired. At the top of a company, too, it was a family affair. That's a fact. Cunard have got ahead of us. We must show them we won't let them stay there. Well, I'm sure you'll relish the opportunity to do that, William. Peary's chief of design was his wife's brother, Alexander Carlyle. Chalk and a cheese. Tommy, Roderick. Alexander's put you in the picture. Indeed. It's tremendous news. Thomas Andrews was Piri's nephew. Many believed he was already being groomed to take over the company. An entire new class of liner. It's extraordinarily bold. Of course, it's only a starting Roderick point, Chisholm, gentlemen. chief draftsman. I told Ismay he could have them within four to five years. Really, William, we all know how much you like to throw down a challenge, but quite frankly, that is ridiculous. Why? These ships cannot simply be imagined into existence, William. Of course, Alexander. And yes, I am laying down a challenge. Perhaps the greatest in the history of shipbuilding. That's a challenge I know you'll want to take on. And with Tommy and Roderick to help, you can turn the vision into a reality. Piri's iron will ruled throughout the yard. Get up at it, you? That Every second of the shipbuilding day was his. Even the lavatories were known as the minutes because of the timekeeper at the door. Seven minutes per worker per day. That was the rule. Poor stay in the yard, I. Oh, come on, laddie. It's the welcome every new boy gets. <laughs> Get his trousers! Oh, oh, leave him be. Come on, keep on, let's flower it. said, leave him be. <laughs> no, no, no. Come on, let's leave flower it, you roll. That's the only thing you Catholics are good at. Just one in eight workers at the yard was Catholic. Is that a fact now? Go on with you. Egypt. But Lord Piri frowned on sectarianism. Friendships across the divide with Protestants like Tommy Miller were commonplace. I have not charity, it profiteth me not. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity the dinner break threw everyone together. 
For 45 minutes, a man's time was his own to spend as he pleased, in discussion and debate, gambling or games, and of course, the Bible. Prepare to burn in hell! No one was blind to religion, but more important still was the division between trades, and the kings of the yard with the toughest job were the riveters. Michael Flaherty, for one. Thank you. Thanks for that. Oh, my dad's a riveter, Alfie. He's as deaf as a post. Deaf as a what? That's why he wouldn't let me follow him. Got me signed on as a shipwright and joiner instead. Safer trade for us, eh, Mr. Miller? Safer? You say so. But weren't you afraid to tell those fellows where to go, like with them being Protestants and all? You're a Protestant. Who's Mr. Miller here? Should we be afraid of you? Live and let live, I say. Aye. We're all Irish men here. Even himself. Is that Mr. Perry? Lord Perry to me and you. Must be something mighty important to have brought him down here, though, Mr. Miller. With the new liners, change was coming. Before Perry could build his giant ships, he had to rebuild his shipyard completely. New slipways, new gantries. Perry was making history. And to record it, he appointed the finest photographer in Ireland. Robert Welch would capture every phase of Titanic's construction. Titanic had begun with a gentleman's agreement. A year on, there was still nothing in writing. Everything depended on Bruce Ismay. Well, it's got four funnels. Correct. But you said there'd only be three engines. William feels these ships will be more cost-effective with only three. And, of course, we all know that the more funnels the ship has, the keener the paying public are to travel on. Cunard built the Mauritania and the Lusitania with four. We didn't think you'd want your ships to have less. So, one funnel is an ornament? Correct, sir. Well... I think she's magnificent. <laughs> How soon can you start? We can commence work on ship 400 in a matter of months. 401, soon after. Well then, I'd better sign the contract. Of course. Now, they'll need names. We can't keep calling them ships 400 and 401. Surely, since 400 is the first in the class, we must call her Olympic. Agreed. And 401? She's your ship, Bruce. William, you know your classics. Olympus was home to the Greek gods, that's true, but what of their great rivals, the Titans? Giants, every one of them. Olympic's partner should surely be Titanic. Very good. Titanic it is, then. Was ever a ship more appropriately named? Olympic and Titanic. In Piri's eyes, these giant liners would usher in an age of boundless prosperity. What could possibly go wrong? breaking over Belfast. Before Lord Piddy could build the future, he had to destroy the past. Three entire slipways were raised to the ground to make way for two massive cradles where Olympic and Titanic would be laid. Out of the chaos, Piddy's vision began to take shape. These giant vessels would need mammoth construction gantries. A 6,000-ton steel skeleton towering over 200 feet, taller than Westminster Abbey. At its heart was an intricate system of mobile cranes designed to reach every part of the ships beneath. 
Perry had promised the biggest ships the world had ever seen. It was for the design team to deliver them. They were led by Alexander Carlyle. But it was Perry whose word was final. For him, Olympic and Titanic would confirm Harland and Wolfe as the world's greatest shipbuilder. And even the youngest of his workers felt the same. What's that face about? The Olympic. What about the Olympic? You know they're laying down our keel tomorrow. Aye. Our gang's only being sent to do the shore in honor. So what? Well, come on, Alfie. She's going to be famous all over the world. So is Titanic. And Mr. Frost says, our crew's going to be fitting Titanic's engines. Well, Olympic's going to be built first. So what? Just the ship that matters. My arse. She is too. Olympic's going to be the ship that everyone talks about. Aye. Right. First to start building. First to be launched. First across the Atlantic. Titanic's going to be a mighty ship. That no one remembers. The yard was full of expectation. The new gantries waiting for the ships to rise within them. And a handful of workers hardly daring to dream they might yet sail on. Barely three months later, Titanic's own keel was being laid. a gigantic steel spire to support her 880-foot length. The keel plates stood the height of a man, easily reached by the seven-ton riveting machine suspended from the gantry. The wooden blocks beneath were carefully angled, ready for the eventual launch. Meanwhile, the steel frames that would form Titanic's ribs were being prepared. In the molding loft, a room the size of a football pitch, full-scale cross-sections of the ship were drawn in chalk, and the steel work that would give her shape was bent to match. One by one, the 300 frames of the hull were reared into place. And Lord Pirrie's ambitions were also growing. Political ambitions. Pirrie had always been a unionist, happy with his place in the United Kingdom. Overnight, he turned to nationalism. Ireland would prosper more, he argued, free from rule by London. Many Irishmen shared this vision. They called it Home Rule, but Piddy was playing with fire. Those against Home Rule included many of his own workers. As Titanic took shape, a rift was developing in the shipyard. Is this what you call studying, then, young man? Just taking a wee break, ma. Some sight, though, isn't it? There's a lot of men I know down there from the yard. Look! There's Mr. Frost, my foreman. You best not let him see you taking time away from your studies, then. What with all the exams you've got to pass. Every Tommy Miller's family had dreams of their own. Where was the sail to when you built her, Daddy? America. Where's America? I'll show you some. Here is Ireland. Here is Belfast. And here's America. A lot of people go there. A lot of Irishmen go there. Why? Apple pie. What? They say they've got the best apple pie in the world. Apple pie like you've never tasted. Covered in cream. Honest? Can we go? Tommy. You're still not yourself, are you? I'm just a wee bit tired, that's all. You need to go and see Dr. Henry. I can't afford it. An outside lavatory, a tin bath, and just about enough food on the table for the men building Titanic. 
And for the most discerning of our first-class passengers, there will be a choice of 39 private suites, each one of which will comprise bedroom, bathroom, private sitting and dining rooms, all fitted out to the highest standards. Yes, gentlemen, uh, splendid though these plans are. We had agreed to discuss less exotic subjects today. Now then, gentlemen, I propose we install 16 lifeboat stations, four lifeboats at each station, giving us up to a total of 64 lifeboats. Which would exceed Board of Trade regulations by some way. As Board of Trade regulations stand. But given the size of these ships, we must surely expect them to demand greater lifeboat accommodation. William? I'm sure it's best to prepare for all eventualities. Now, if we look at the first-class lounge, the Palace of Versailles. It had taken a year. The titanic skeleton was in place. Now it was time for her outer skin. 2,000 steel plates, 30 feet long and 6 feet broad, each one over an inch thick, weighing three tons. Plates were fixed to the frames with rivets, but the curving lines of the hull were too complex now for machines. This called for hair's breadth judgment and muscle power. Three million rivets, red-hot iron stitches would hold this ship together. 1,500 tons of them. As Titanic's bulk grew, underneath her, the work of fixing the wooden shoring continued, hard and dangerous. Thank God for that, Jimmy. Beneath the activity, there was unease. The rift over home rule was growing. The fiercest opposition came from the orange order. It's Alfie Cunningham, isn't it? Aye. You ever thought of joining a lodge, son? Oh, well, uh, maybe I have, like, but... The Bally McCarrick Lodge. We meet. I know where you meet. Well, that's grand. We're there every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. I hope to see you. Aye. Maybe you will. You wouldn't. Wouldn't what? Go to an Orange Lodge meeting? Who says? Uh, what an idiot you look in a sash and a bowler hat, banging a stupid great drum. Get lost, oh, flattered, Come on, you? can't you take a joke? I'm looking for my sister's husband, Tommy Miller. Do you know him? I, I, he's over there. Thomas! Thomas! Honey, what are you doing here? It's Jeannie. The tide in Tommy Miller's life was turning. I found her on the kitchen floor. Dr. Henry says it's rheumatic fever. Is it bad, doctor? Before antibiotics, rheumatic fever was common. The result, almost certainly, would be heart disease. Same shape as you've been building for years, isn't it? But Francis bigger. Carruthers, the representative from the Board of Trade, charged with ensuring safety standards. Oh, yes, I'm not disputing the size, the colossal. But the hydrodynamics haven't changed at all. Long and narrow in beam. Which is why they're known as the Greyhounds of the Sea. Or coffin ships, as your rivals refer to them. <laughs> no time for joking, Mr. Crothers. We're here to discuss safety, not aesthetics. And these discussions, a year before Titanic's launch, would be critical. They would determine who would live, who would die, and they would cost the lives of two of the men in that room. What would happen if she were in a collision? And were to behold as a result? Well, I think I can fairly say that our new bulkhead door system is both revolutionary and unique. The damaged area will be completely sealed from the rest of the vessel, hermetically sealed. In theory, 
She should stay afloat no matter what the damage. The ship is, in a real sense, her own lifeboat. Nonetheless, I see you've allowed for uh, 16 lifeboats. 16? Now, I have made allowance for a great deal more than 16. But 16 will meet the legal requirement exactly. Lord Pirry knows that. He has spoken directly to you? Well, yes. The provision of lifeboats. The entire design is my responsibility. For Carlisle, 40 years with Harland and Wolfe, this was breaking point. The regulations clearly show that 16 lifeboats is sufficient for a vessel of 10,000 tons and over. Agreed, William. But these ships are five times that size. How on earth can we get more than 3,000 people into 16 lifeboats? I have freely offered a further provision of four life rafts as well. We are now giving them more than their regulations demand. Oh, the regulations are out of date. This is a theoretical risk only, Alexander. The ships have been designed by you so that they cannot sink. Don't you see, William? Any human design is fallible. Surely the first rule of safety must be to think the unthinkable. And you are happy for our passengers to do the same. What? Has it occurred to you what they would think if the promenade decks were festooned with lifeboats? You are concerned the passengers may be alarmed by the lifeboats? In the numbers you recommend, yes. Our intention is to offer passengers the experience of a lifetime. Not to frighten them so much they never want to travel on a white star ship again. So. This is one of your economic decisions. These ships have to sail at a profit, Alexander. And I have to build them at a profit. And no doubt not having to provide a few dozen lifeboats will add a small but very welcome addition to your profit margin. You know that's nonsense. Alexander! It was the end of Carlyle's involvement with the company. Titanic was the last ship he would ever design. Titanic would need a new chief designer. For Lord Pity, there was only one choice, his nephew, Thomas Andrews. In the spring of that year, 1910, Halley's Comet was visible in the night skies throughout Europe. Some say it was there when Andrews took his wife, Helen, pregnant with their firstborn, to show off his new liner. She's my ship now, Helen. Titanic and Thomas Andrews would be inseparable to the very end. By the spring of 1910, Olympic's hull was fully plated. For the workers on Titanic, the challenge was to catch up. Working with hot metal, speed was everything. The riveters were paid on piece freight. The faster they worked, the more they earned. Danger was always close by. Samuel Joseph Scott, aged 15, was the first to die on Titanic. 17 would lose their lives building these ships. Alfie Cunningham was starting work on Titanic's boilers. Theirs was the heartbeat that would pump 30,000 horsepower to the engines. 29 boilers fed by 159 furnaces, burning over 600 tons of coal each day. The boilers dwarfed the men who built them, but Titanic was designed for efficiency. Excess steam would be diverted through a turbine to increase her power by more than half. And this is where all that energy would be driven, to the giant manganese bronze propellers. A central one of 22 tons, flanked by two more, 38 tons each and four times the height of a man. It was these that would drive Titanic through the Atlantic swell but that was still two years away. 
First, a 200-ton floating crane was needed to lower the engines and boilers into Titanic. A German company was supervising the crane's construction. But as the monster grew, so the rows began. And I'm telling you, Bonehead, if you want us up there, you can whistle! The Belfast men were deeply suspicious of the Germans. The lads reckon it's none too safe up there. And they might have a point. The way they see it, it's a German crane. Let them risk their own necks. See, a lot of the boys are convinced they're spies. <laughs> Come here to steal the secrets of our new ships. Sell them to our competitors. No one was better equipped to tackle the problem than the chief draftsman, Roderick Chisholm. His way with words would eventually win him a place on Titanic. Roddy Chisholm had worked his way into management from the shop floor. He could get on with anyone. Better still, he spoke German. National pride was at stake. The Germans agreed to finish the crane themselves. For young men, these were stirring times. Patriotism and religion were to be celebrated. Alfie hadn't joined the Orange Order himself. He was too busy studying. But he could understand the pride felt by those who were orange men. You all right there, Alfie? Fine, Mr. Frost. Good man. He was proud, too, of Titanic. This was the launch day for Olympic. Lord Pity was never happy to see work stop. Those watching the launch had to forfeit their pay. Alfie! What are you doing here? Aren't you going to come watch? Watch what? You know what? Five minutes to go. Come on. You want me to lose half a day's wages just to watch that old tin tub splash into the lagoon? Just my ship, Alfie. Aye. And I'm trying to build mine here, if you hadn't noticed. You're an Egypt, Cunningham. So you are. With hard work, Alfie might yet get onto Titanic. But today, it was Olympic in the limelight. Lord Perry had even had her painted white for the photographs. The giant floating crane was ready at last. But the German flag had been raised as a finishing touch. The Belfast men were not impressed. That flag is an insult to us all. Those Germans are looking to start trouble here. And I promised you all a drink. The Germans surrendered both the crane and their flag. They were even persuaded to hoist the Union Jack. Soon enough, these men really would be at war. But for now, peace. Six days a week, noise from the yard echoed across Belfast. On Sundays, it stopped. That's when the men brought their families to admire their work. Now, would you call that a funnel or not? You could fit a tram car in it. Imagine the size of the engine I'm having to build. As needs a funnel that size to take away the smoke. Now the stage was set for Titanic. It was launch day, and time for differences to be set aside. So 
What's going on? Ah, oh, sure, they've only sent me over to help knock out the shores on Titanic. He's working on our ship. After all this time, I'm saying she was second best. All right. And I reckon you'll be permanent, son. Olympic seals off for sea trials this afternoon. So go on, then. Get to work. Aye, but you be careful under there, son. That's no place for skylarking. Aye, of course I will. You right then, Michael? Where are you two off to? We're travelling first class, so we are. You what? We'll be going down the slip on her. We'll have to help gather in the cable. That's not fair. No, it isn't, is it? <laughs> A last inspection for Piri and Ismay. Even without engines and fittings, the hull weighed 24,000 tons. As the timber props were knocked away, her full weight settled onto the sliding way. On the launch platform, Captain Edward J. Smith, who would skip her both Olympic and Titanic. Ten minutes to the launch, and a red flag was hoisted to warn other river traffic to stand clear. Titanic now rested fully on the slipway, thickly coated with 20 tons of liquid soap and train oil. Just two hydraulic triggers held her in check. There would be no champagne, no ceremonial naming for Titanic. That was not the White Star way. A simple command Ready. was enough. Release the triggers! she entered the water with scarcely a ripple. She was already traveling at 12 knots. Only the drag chains trailing behind, 160 tons of them, could draw her to a halt. It had taken just 62 seconds. Titanic was afloat. Nothing could check the chain of events that would follow now and it would destroy the life of the very man who had brought Titanic into being. The slipways were empty for the first time in over two years. Titanic was in the water. She was still an empty shell waiting for carpenters, engineers and painters to transform her into a liner. Meanwhile, her sister ship, Olympic, was on her maiden voyage. Thomas Andrews was anxious for news. At last, a wire from Olympic. Yes? From Mr. Ismay. He's raised some real concerns about the ship. The springs in the mattresses are too soft, and there's a lack of cigarette holders in the WCs. Also, we are short of a potato peeler. Well done, Tommy. Well done. But even as Titanic's slipway was being cleared, there was another forewarning of tragedy to come. James Dobbin, aged 43, was fatally injured by falling timbers. He died the next day. <clears throat> Already, Titanic was at the fitting out wharf, but it would be almost a year before she was ready to sail. Funnels and boilers, decking and lighting, furnishings, fittings and paintings, all had to be put into place, 
everything to live up to the dream of the world's greatest liner. And in that year, the guarantee group would be chosen too, the eight workers who'd earn themselves a trip on the maiden voyage. Many had scarcely left Belfast. America was beyond imagining. Shall I tell you something, Liam Flaherty? What's that, Mr. Miller? I think you're on your way to being a half-decent shipwright. You should tell my dad that. Yeah, that is deaf. I mentioned it to a few other people, though. Mr. Cumming, the gaffer, for example. Well, that's good of you, Mr. Miller. I might have done you a bigger favour than you think. Why is that? He's been asked by Mr. Andrews to recommend a shipwright and an apprentice to go on Titanic's maiden voyage. You don't mean... He's thinking of recommending you and me. Thinking off is as far as it goes at the moment, Liam. Every day counted to complete Titanic. Piri could not afford distractions. There must be no let-up coming. Not at all. I understand. <sighs> but there was no escaping the bitterness in the yard. Ireland was heading for political crisis. Home rule simply means granting Ireland a measure of independence. It doesn't mean casting ourselves adrift in the Atlantic. With respect, that isn't how many of the men in the yard see it. And they're blind. If we get this right now, Tommy, the future of Ireland will be assured for a hundred years or more. Now have that removed, will you? Just to stand up and our law Most of Piri's workers were against home rule. Unionists were determined to resist Irish independence by force, if need be. Between duplexes, politicians in London and hope loving nationalists here in Ireland, we will resist their plans with every means at our disposal. There will be no surrender. There will be no compromise to the enemies. The workers of this shipyard will be at the vanguard. The talk was of treachery. And for Piddy's workers, there was one man they could not forgive. William Piddy! Come on, ready to deal with the devil! To sell his own soul if it suits him! There was poison in the air. They will not succeed! They might be going to New York. New York? What are you talking about? Well, it's not definite, but Mr. Miller thinks you've a real chance of being asked. Get lost, Liam. Aye. So you get a hundred yards from the Falls Road and you don't know where the hell you are. Did not take you to New York, son. New York. But she's not even <laughs> your ship. Olympic's always been your ship. Yeah, well, Titanic's my ship now. Whatever happened to you, Alfie Cunningham? Mr. Gilzane. How long is it since you promised to come to one of our lodge meetings? Oh, well, I didn't exactly promise. It's just difficult. I've classes up at the Institute most nights. Well, study's a fine thing. But you should be studying the history of your own people, your own traditions. I'm sure you're right, Mr. Gilzine. And it's not just all talk these days, believe me. We're having drill most nights. Ready for all eventualities. Who does he think he is? Drill. There's a lot of that going on at the lodges these days. There's talk they'll be getting rifles. Aye, it's madness. Why? Some of us want this kingdom to stay united. There's a lot of Irishmen who don't want home rule. So you're going to fight too? I haven't said that. Start a civil war. We don't want to start any war. We just want to stay loyal to our country. You're starting to sound more and more like your man, Gilzine. Full of shite. So is this true? You really might get asked to go to New York? Maybe. But I've been thinking, whether I do go or not, we should go. As a family. America? To live? The doctor says you need dry air, clear air. All it does is rain in this city. We can't leave Belfast. Why not? Because this is our home. We can't give that all up just because of me. People leave Ireland every day. And it wouldn't be just because of you. This city, that yard, there's something bad in the air. It's not the place I want to be anymore. A 
Only on Titanic now did the real world seem far away. Piri's vision was coming to life. To those who built her, Titanic had turned into a ship of dreams. Would you look at her, Alfie? Titanic's magnificent. Did we really build all this? You, me, and one or two more. She didn't build herself, that's for sure. But isn't she grand? Solid. Like she's always been here. And always will be. Maybe she's too good for the likes of us now, though. Elliot. Then, disaster. Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, was holed in a collision with a Royal Navy cruiser, HMS Hawk. The impact was felt back in Belfast, because the man responsible was the skipper who would soon also command Titanic, Captain Smith. The captain of HMS Hawk, quite simply, got too close and lost control. The concern now was that these liners were monster ships, too big to be handled safely. And it's plain from the photographs which vessel came off worse. Titanic's builders were past masters at handling the press. That Olympic comfortably survived the collision. Consider what would have happened to any other vessel which had suffered such severe damage. Say the Mauritania. <laughs> As water flooded in, her poor crewmen would have scurried around frantically trying to close the doors between all her separate compartments and stem the flow. A vain endeavor. But we at Harland and Wolf, gentlemen, have introduced automatic watertight doors. A simple flick of the switch, Sahara ship, and render her safe. Much had been made of the watertight doors, a design that Harland and Wolf had actually borrowed from a German rival. What was undeniable was that they worked. As soon as water is detected in the ship, an electric switch is automatically thrown, causing all the bulkhead doors throughout the ship to close at once. Mr. Frost. I should come to this side of the door, Mr. Green. Or you may get very wet. There we are. Home and dry. You see? With her automatic doors in place, Olympic had stayed afloat, even with two compartments completely flooded. So this, in your view, makes the ship what? Unsinkable? Captain Smith had long argued exactly that. I cannot conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. Modern shipping has simply gone beyond that. Look, if there's a ship safer, we don't know of it. As far as I'm concerned, she is practically unsinkable. Practically unsinkable was the phrase used to sell Titanic. To most people, it meant simply that Titanic was safe. The fact that her sister ship had survived a collision with a cruiser only reinforced that. Titanic's completion schedule had been critically hit. One of her propeller shafts was now needed to repair Olympic. Lord Pirrie pushed the date of Titanic's sailing back into April 1912. A fatal move. By then, the melting ice pack would lie directly in her path. Piri was on a collision course of his own, bent on home rule, come what may. He intended to stage a rally in the heart of Belfast. His choice of speaker would outrage his opponents. It has to be Mr. Churchill, Margaret. You know they'll hate you for it. We'll make them see the error of their ways. Winston Churchill, the Lord of the Admiralty, was a hate figure for Ulster loyalists. Like Piri, he had a unionist pedigree. He too was seen as a traitor. Keep it coming. Good man. No trouble in there. Easy, does it? Ulster's future was in the balance, but Titanic, at last, was in dry dock. Unionists or not, for some workers, it was finishing the ship that mattered. Mr. Frost. What? Uh, you know how there's always a bunch of fellas sent with a ship on its maiden voyage? The guarantee group? Aye. I have a pal who reckons he might be chosen. Is that a fact now? 
I, I was wondering if, like, you know, his foreman might be kidding him on. Why would he do that now? Well, for a start, this pal's a Catholic. No, but, I mean, there's some people in this yard who say if you're not a Protestant and a member of an Orange Lodge, for that matter, you're lucky to have a job at all, let alone go to America on Titanic. There's no place for sectarianism in this yard. The job's what matters. I say that as a Protestant and an Orange man. Could be true. New York? I wouldn't know. I'd only know which engineers would be going. You? Might also have a short list of apprentices in mind to take with me. You don't mean... Take nothing for granted, Alfie. But... Just get on, work hard, see what happens. For Alfie Cunningham, new horizons. But Tommy Miller's prospects were darkening. Boys, what are you doing? Honey. Oh, no. Jeannie Miller was just 32 when she died. Titanic's maiden voyage was only weeks away. The guarantee group was on everyone's mind. You're lying. I am not. Maybe we'll both get to go to New York. Maybe well, he's just stringing you along. Mr. Frost knows I'm good at my job. And you're a prod like he is. What's that got to do with it? Do you chances any harm, will it? What do you mean? Are you saying Mr. Frost's a bigot? Of course I'm not. Then why'd you say it? It's a joke, Alfie. No, it wasn't. I know Arthur Frost's not a bigot. I shouldn't have said anything. Aye, well, you did. What's all this? They're searching us, aren't they? Searches were routine, but the loyalists were preparing to fight with whatever came to hand. Sorry, Matt, no harm, fella. Rivets had stitched Titanic together. They also made lethal ammunition. As Perry prepared to welcome Churchill, the mood in Belfast was ugly. 10,000 troops had been drafted in. Margaret, if I thought it would come to this, I'm not sure that I'd have... Even the threat of violence is a disgrace, William. It's an attempt to stifle free speech. You'll not let them succeed. I most certainly will not. Perry and Churchill found themselves facing the full fury of the Unionists. And rivets weren't their only weapons. There were guns on the streets. Perry and Churchill were lucky to escape with their lives. Perry had never been battered in any confrontation, but that day changed everything. Lord Perry fled Ireland, humiliated. Conceived Titanic, the greatest shipbuilder in the world, would never see her again. After five long years, Titanic was almost complete in the dry dock. But with Lord Perry's departure, all order had gone. It was no longer safe if you didn't belong. Excuse me, what's wrong with you? Show some manners, will you? I don't take any lessons in manners from you, dirty little pig. Hey, get away. You two think you're safe, don't you? Well, not anymore. 
Perry ran away in case he didn't hear. All Catholics run away in the end. Perry's not a Catholic. Oi, he's a Catholic lover. Even worse. Come on, son. Leave it. You're better than this. To the Unionist, Titanic had become a British ship. To the Nationalists, an Irish ship. The world was shifting. It's about the guarantee group is still haven't heard anything. Oh, that's all right. Aye, but the thing is, if you're chosen, you'll not be going with me. What? You mean you've heard you're not going? No. I'm giving this job up. Why? This yard. Never did feel safe, but now it is. I don't know. I get a bad feeling about the place, and I have two wains to look after. What with our mother going? I've taken a job as a deckhand at the White Star Line. Oh, that's grand. It'll take you away from home. No, oh, my sister-in-law, Annie, will look after the boys. When I've saved enough, I'm going to bring him out to America. New life. Oh. Good luck. Bye. Thanks. Titanic had been conceived in London's Belgravia. That's where Piddy had taken refuge. Uncle William. Thomas. Thank you for coming over. It's the best thing, until things settle down in Belfast and you're able to return. There'll be no return. I've done with Belfast. You're not saying you've done with shipbuilding. There must be more to life than building ships, Tommy. But I'm going to need you to run the Belfast shipyard for me from now on. Uncle no William. arguments. You're a unionist and the best liked man in Harland and Wolf. Something else I want you to do. Titanic's maiden voyage. I was supposed to sail with her. I can't now. Why? My health. A small tumor. My doctor insists I must have an operation. But you will recover. I want you to take my place on Titanic. Ismay is going too. Between the two of you, you can decide if this whole enterprise was worth it. I'm not sure if I know anymore. There was a different sickness in Belfast. Politics were being fueled by anger and fear. And in the shipyard, there were scores to be settled. regrets to inform you that you're out of a job. And tell him to come down here and tell me so himself. Walt Flaherty! You're not that deaf. You touch me one more time, so. You know what? Ah, what's going on? Liam, get out of here! I'll be coming up! Some news for you. Titanic sails on April 1st. And we're on her. We're in the guarantee group. Go on, boy, no. just go! What are you doing? Your old man's just been sacked. We're after escorting him from the yard. Ah, away, Liam! April Fool's Day. Aye, but it's not a joke. And, and neither is this. Your pal, Liam Flaherty's definitely going with us. Does he know? I doubt it. Assisted, like the proud men you are. <laughs> you Athenian scum! Get back to the falls with you. There'll be a tram any time. What's now. going on? These men have decided to look for work elsewhere. What? You've done this to them because they're Catholics. They got what was coming. You make me sick. Come on, son. Come on. 
You can't let them drive you out like this. That's what I thought. Liam, you can't. You've been picked for the guarantee group. It's definite. We're on Titanic together. Tell them they'll need to get someone else, will you? In the face of bigotry, many friendships were coming to an end. Titanic now was ready to leave the city of her birth and to face her final test. Her sea trials. Signal tanks to release us. Release tanks. Five years of endeavor for Not one moment. Not the engines. Away we go, boys. steam from the boilers drove the main engines at a pressure of over 200 pounds per square inch. Gentlemen, Titanic is underway. central propeller, she was brought up to cruising speed. There had been last minute changes, more first class staterooms and private promenades. They'd made her heavier, a thousand tons heavier than her sister ship. At over 46,000 tons, Titanic was now the world's biggest ship. The sea trials were not a formality. Hard to stop him. Hard to stop him. Francis Carruthers from the Board of Trade was on the bridge. In three years of construction, he'd inspected Titanic almost 2,000 times. I don't expect her to turn on a sixpence, Captain Smith. Just within reasonable limits. It was for him to sign her safety certificate. On that April day in the Irish Sea, Titanic was put to the crucial test. At her full speed, 21 knots, how quickly could she stop? Full speed astern. Full speed astern. Full astern! as quick as you can! slowed, the hopes of all who'd built her quickened. Well, Mr. Crothers. 850 yards. Well done. That's quite acceptable. Excellent. Excellent. She'd stopped in under half a mile, less than three times her own length. Her passenger certificate was endorsed. Good for one year. Titanic was free to take on the world. And chance had brought aboard someone who knew her very well. Mr. Miller! Oh, Two months earlier, Thomas Miller had left the shipyard, but White Star was short of crew. He was back on the ship he'd helped to build. Hey, Ren. I hope you are. Only my second job as a deckhand to New York on Titanic. Uh, they were short-handed. My good luck. <laughs> well, isn't that the best news? And you're going too. Aye. So we'll be seeing plenty more of each other. Oh, well, that. You're off it. Can I pay you some up we'll pay in New York?
With the fading light, Titanic prepared to leave her birthplace for good. And Thomas Andrews gathered his prized guarantee group, the troubleshooting team for the maiden voyage. Eight trusted men, among them Roderick Chisholm, Artie Frost. Look out for your mommy for me. Okay. Alfie Cunningham. That Tommy Miller was also there must have seemed a happy accident. A penny each. Now this year's. Don't spend them till I come back. We'll be even richer then. All right. Artie Frost, we know, was sure of promotion on his return. And Alfie's hard work had also paid off. The shipyard had named him Apprentice of the Year. His future was secure. Mr. Welch, goodbye. Goodbye and good luck. Every man boarded Titanic in hope and expectation. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Twelve days later, on the night of April the 14th, 1912, Titanic, the biggest ship in the world, met her iceberg, shaped by nature six times her size. She carried over 2,200 passengers and crew, but lifeboats for only half that number. As rivets popped and steel plates parted, Half a dozen gashes left Titanic mortally wounded. She had been designed to stay afloat with up to four compartments flooded. Under the iceberg's impact, six sprang open. Five years in the making, Titanic sank in two hours and 40 minutes. Thomas Andrews is said to have helped many to escape. He was last seen alone in first class. Artie Frost was witnessed heading down into the engine room. The body of Roderick Chisholm, chief draftsman, was never recovered. Alfie Cunningham, 21 years old, was reported among the survivors. It was a case of mistaken identity. And Tommy Miller died alongside his former workmates. All of the guarantee group the men who built Titanic died on board their ship. 1,500 more people died with them. Titanic's owner, Bruce Ismay, did find a place in the lifeboats, a disgrace that finished his career. The Titanic inquiry cleared the shipbuilders of blame, but Lord Perry's health was broken. He died with his business almost bankrupt. In Belfast, the men who built and sailed on Titanic are remembered by name. Their families still cherish their memories and keepsakes. From Thomas Andrews, a telescope. From Roderick Chisholm, a book presented for Titanic's launch. From Artie Frost, his foreman's whistle and slide rule. And from Tommy Miller, the two pennies he gave his children. We'll spend them till I come back. We'll be even richer then. Those who built Titanic believed they stood at the dawn of a new era. Sadly, they were right. Within two years, the entire world would be at war. The Edwardian dream was over. But the dreams of the men who brought Titanic to life would never die. They have become part of her legend. There's more information about the building of the Titanic, the politics of Belfast, and also the history of ship design at itv.com slash Titanic. Well, Doc Martin's back next Thursday at 9, but later tonight, Raggy Omar visits the victims whose faith has been affected by the events of Boxing Day 2004.
Tsunami Journeys at 5 past 11, after the news, which is next.